what's up everyone, Game Dad here, coming at you guys with another compilation video, and this time we are taking a look at everything that was in my collection series covering the Nintendo Super Entertainment System, the SNES, or SNES. I don't know why people call it a SNES, it's an SNES. Now if you are new to the channel, please be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below, as well as that little notification bell, so you can alert every time I got a new video coming out. Now let's go ahead and dive in and check out the games that were on the list. Animaniacs was released by Konami in 1994, and this takes the classic, you know, kids cartoon where you're playing as Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, and you are just getting into video game shenanigans now. You have basic, you know, kind of adventure platforming action. And overall, I mean, the game is a lot of fun. It's super wacky, just like the cartoon, and it translates very well into a video game. Up next, we got Barbie Supermodel, released by Software Creations in 1993. And this game, it's like a set of mini games, kind of, that all play terribly. They all control terribly. And I mean, honestly, what do you expect from a Barbie game? None of them have ever been very good. But, I mean, I guess, you know, there was some sort of a market for it. And here we have Battle Clash, released by Intelligent Systems in 1992. And this game, I couldn't get any further past the start screen, just because the way that I was capturing footage would not allow me to actually use the Super Scope to play this game. But it is pretty fun. I mean, it's exactly what you would expect from a Super Scope game. You just point and click and, you know, shoot the baddies. That's basically it. Now here we have Battletoads and Battle Maniacs, released by Rare in 1993, and this is kind of like an upgraded NES take on a Battletoads game. It has a lot more enemies, it's definitely sticking with the whole beat-em-ups vibe, and overall, I mean, it's okay graphically, of course it's better than the NES, but it's just an okay game. And here we have Battletoads and Double Dragon, released by Rare, also in 1993. And this game combines all the characters of Battletoads and Double Dragon, puts them all into one giant beat-em-up where you guys are teaming up and just having a blast taking out the baddies. This game is pretty fun. I will say the controls and enemies are very unforgiving, but, I mean, that's kind of to be expected with a Battletoads game, right? And up next, we got Big Sky Trooper, released by Lucas Arts in 1995. And this game is a little wacky. I mean, it is fun, but it's pretty quirky in the sense that, you know, you start the game, you answer some very, like, bogus questions, and you do so well that you become a 21 star general and a Big Sky Trooper. And then you just start playing the game. I mean, it's fun, but it's definitely kind of wacky. Here we have Bill Walsh College Football, released by Visual Concepts in 1994, and as with most sports games, if you've been watching any of these collection videos in the past, you know I'm terrible at them, I don't understand the appeal, and this game is no different, it just has worse graphics than some of its 3D counterparts. I mean, I, I just, I don't see the appeal in football games, especially video game versions of them. Here's a fun one. We got Boogerman, a pick and flick adventure released by Interplay Entertainment in 1995. And this game definitely tries to go over the top with the gross factor. I mean, your ammunition is you're flicking boogers at people. As you can see, there's snot dripping off of everything. There's gross pimples that you can pop on the ground. You collect plungers. I mean, if you just stand there long enough, the guy will just start picking his nose and eating it. So very goofy, rather gross, but still a fun platformer. Up next, we got Brain Lord, released by Produce in 1994. And this game is your typical RPG from the 16-bit era. You go through a crap ton of dialogue and messages and stuff before you ever get to actually playing the game. But overall, I mean, it's pretty fun. There are better RPGs, but this one, it really wasn't half bad. Up next is Bubsy 2, released by Accolade in 1993. And I don't know who was asking for a second one of these. I don't know who was asking for the modern remake of this, but these games are just not great. I mean, this is like a total Sonic vibe that you're seeing right here. You gotta just run fast. But the platforming isn't that great. The controls aren't that great. I mean, it's a cool mascot character, and the levels look really nice, but that's about it. Up next is Super Castlevania IV, released by Konami in 1991, and this game is absolutely fantastic. This is a very good entry in the Castlevania franchise, and 
It has all of the classic gameplay that you would expect with massively updated graphics for the 16-bit era and great music, great gameplay, and it's just a blast. This is such a good game. You should definitely pick it up. Up next is Choplifter 3, released by Beam Software in 1994, and this one I really like compared to the other Choplifter games that I have. The graphics are great, the music is great, and the controls are just so much better than other ones. Plus, you know, if you get shot, you don't instantly die you actually get a health bar and you go and collect you know all the different soldiers and stuff and just you know classic gameplay but super fun here's a fun but weird one that is clay fighter released by visual concepts in 1993 and everything is just like claymation but i will say this game is difficult i don't know if it's just me and i'm just terrible at it which is very possible but i was beating the heck out of this person, and then in one move, she almost completely destroyed me. So, yeah, this game is unforgiving. Up next is Clay Fighter 2 Judgment Clay, released by Interplay Entertainment in 1995. And this game, it's still like claymation, but they definitely went in a different route with it, and I don't really like it. I mean, it's a different publisher, so maybe that's why it was so drastically changed. But overall, I thought the first Clay Fighter was a lot better than this one. Up next is Chrono Trigger, released by Square in 1995. And this is quite possibly one of the greatest Super Nintendo games, if not one of the greatest RPGs ever made, hands down. If this isn't your favorite one, I'm almost positive it would be in your top five. This is a fantastic game. Amazing graphics, amazing effects, extremely satisfying gameplay music everything is awesome in there here's a fun one that is cool spot released by virgin interactive in 1993 and although there are several versions of the cool spot games i think the super nintendo one is probably my favorite it's just classic platforming action and it's just fun you go through you're getting all the spots playing as your number one seven up character and that's about it i mean you just jump on stuff get points and go to the next level up next, we got Cool World, released by Ocean Software in 1993, and this one is a video game adaptation of the movie of the same name. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I believe it was Brendan Fraser that was in this movie. So, you know, classic 90s kind of action, but very strange game, just like how the movie was very strange. And, I mean, overall, the gameplay is fine. It's kind of like a platformer, beat-em-up style game. It's not terrible, but... Definitely not one where you have to go out and get. Up next is Demolition Man, released by Virgin Interactive in 1995. Again, this is based on the movie of the same name. And honestly, I know it's kind of like a cult classic. This is one of my favorite movies, though. I don't know what it is. It's just so good to me. It was an awesome movie, and this version of the game is actually, in my mind, far superior to the other versions. I think I have this on 3DO, and man, that game is crap. Up next is Desert Strike Return to the Gulf, released by Visual Concepts in 1992. And the graphics are pretty cool in this, and the overall concept behind it is pretty cool. Kind of like a quasi-open world attack helicopter kind of game. The controls are a little strange and hard to get used to, and it is really hard to target in on people to actually take out the enemies. But it is a pretty cool flying 3D-ish helicopter game. Now, here's a game that was better on the Genesis, and that is Disney's Aladdin, released by Capcom in 1993. And while this game, yes, it is good on the Super Nintendo, I will give it credit for that. I just like the Genesis version better because you got a sword. I mean, that was awesome. This game, I will say, it does have difficulty, just like the other versions of it. But overall, I mean, it's a fun platformer. It had a great visual aesthetics, and it's just a classic on the system. Up next, we got Goof Troop, released by Capcom in 1993, and this one reminds me of Adventure Island, sort of, but with a Disney Goofy and his son Max feel to it. I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but overall, I mean, you're just going on an adventure as Goofy and just having some good old classic Disney fun as you do it. Disney's Timon and Pumbaa's Jungle Games, released by Tier Text Design Studios in 1997, and... I don't know why this game was made. This game is terrible. I mean, it's just, as you can see, the graphics are awful. I mean, it's almost like cheesy FMV status, but 
actually drawn in with pixels. I don't know. It's weird. And it's just a bunch of mini games. Like right here, this is Frogger. It's just a blatant ripoff of Frogger. And here's an absolute classic on the SNES. That is Donkey Kong Country, released by Rare in 1994. And this is the one that started it all. I mean, the graphics were just something of the future whenever this came out. The way that they were able to get so detailed with the characters, the music was amazing, the platforming, the levels, everything was just awesome in this game. And you just didn't see other things like this. And here we have the follow-up. That is Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Kong Quest, released by Rare in 1995. And this is just kind of a continuation of the same thing. It's not the exact same story or anything like that. But this time, you actually have Diddy and Dixie Kong that you can play as. So that's pretty fun. But it's more of the same platforming action. There's minor graphical tweaks. There's even more amazing music. And the game is awesome. Last up is the third in the franchise, that is Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, released by Rare in 1996. And this one, they did add more of an interactive overworld kind of mechanic, as you can see there with the boat. But overall, it's the same gameplay from the first two games. Again, slight graphical tweaks. Everything's a little bit brighter, in my opinion. But overall, I don't really care for this one as much as the other two. Number two is definitely my... Doom was released by Sculptured Software in 1995, and the Super Nintendo port is just okay at best. This definitely played better on PC, and there are better ports on other consoles. This one, even though you know it is of this style from this time frame, I still felt that it looked pretty grainy, and it was kind of laggy in its overall gameplay. I don't really care for this version of it. Draken was released by Kemco in 1991, and this is a four-player RPG kind of game. It kind of reminds me of sort of like a Gauntlet Legends sort of game, but in a totally different graphical style and, in my opinion, nowhere near as fun. Earthworm Jim was released by Shiny Entertainment in 1994, and although the Genesis port is a lot of fun, Earthworm Jim 1, I think, is better on the Super Nintendo. I think it's just more colorful. I think the audio is actually better on this one, which normally isn't the case with the Super Nintendo versus the Genesis. But overall, this is a super fun game. It's wacky, and I even remember watching the cartoon as a kid. Up next, we got Earthworm Jim 2, released by Shiny Entertainment in 1995, and this one I didn't care for as much. I mean, the levels, I believe, are more fun, but graphically, I thought it was kind of a downgrade. Looks a little more grainy to me, but I am interested to see with the Intellivision Amico what the new Earthworm Jim game is going to look like. So that's something to look forward to in the future. And here we have a classic, F-Zero, released by Nintendo in 1991, and it this is probably one of my top five games on this console. The game is just so much fun, and I remember spending endless hours with friends just jamming out and playing this game. I mean, that's really all there is to it. This game is amazing. If you haven't played it, you should definitely check it out. And here we have Family Feud, released by Imagineering in 1993, and it's exactly like you would expect. You're playing Family Feud on the Super Nintendo. And I was never a huge fan of the show, but I'm an even like less of a fan of the actual game. It's just, it's really boring. I don't know how games like this ever sold. Up next is Final Fight, released by Capcom in 1991. And this is a classic side-scrolling beat-em-up. This game is awesome. I mean, everyone looks all like totally juiced out and everything, but the game is just fantastic. And just all the different combos you can do, the different moves, going through beating up all the baddies. Just an excellent game all around. And here we have Final Fight 2, released by Capcom in 1993. And this one is just a continuation, really, of the first one. As you can see, you're playing as a different character right here. Way more muscles than any normal human would have. But, you know, that kind of adds to the total meathead, gym rat kind of vibe that these games have. But it's just classic side-scrolling beat-em-up action. It's awesome. And here we have Flashback, The Quest for Identity, released by Delphine Software International in 1994. And I do have this game on a few other consoles, but what's weird about this game in particular is just the animation style. As you can see, they totally went like cartoon 3D with it and really pushed this system to its limits. But overall, I mean, the game is cool. It's unique, and it's actually really fun platforming action. 
Up next is Frank Thomas's Big Hurt Baseball, released by Iguana Entertainment in 1995. And as you can see, for a sports game that's like this, the graphics are really nice. The interface, it's very easy to understand. And whenever it goes to an actual overhead like isometric field view, it's actually really easy to figure out what needs to happen next. So for a sports game, I actually like this one. And here we have GP1, released by Atlas in 1993. And this game reminds me of... I don't know, like an early iteration of MotoGP on more modern day consoles. The game is fun, but it's very flat track and it's a little too easy to control, I would say. It doesn't really have any kind of slide out effects or anything like that that you would expect in a game like this. Up next is Gradius 3, released by Konami in 1991, and this is arguably the best shoot 'em up franchise that exists. The game is fantastic, and this one in particular, in my opinion, is the epitome of the franchise from this era. It's super easy to get into, yet it also provides difficulty later on in the game that just adds to the whole shoot 'em up value. I mean, you want to get into bullet hell type situations when you play these games. Up next, we have Joe and Mac, released by Data East in 1992. And this is just, you know, classic, goofy platforming action kind of action adventure but not really. It does have some unique kind of gameplay stuff, like instead of, you know, killing the enemies when you jump on them like these pterodactyls, you can actually kind of fly on them. So add some new mechanics in there, but overall bright and colorful and I don't know, it, it, it's okay. Now here we have Judge Dredd, released by Probe Entertainment in 1995, and I do happen to be a big fan of this movie. I know not a lot of people are, but this game is it, I don't understand how it represents a movie at all other than in name and maybe a little bit of graphical style. But overall, I mean, it's kind of like a beat -em up shoot -em up crossover. You just go around and blast enemies. I mean, that's really it. Up next is The Jungle Book, released by Eurocom in 1994. And this game is just another one of those classic Disney games. I happen to like this one almost as much as I like, say, Aladdin or Lion King, though. The game is super fun. It's got really good platforming. It definitely has difficulty in some areas. But overall, it's just a fun, like, animated style game. I really enjoy it. Up next is Killer Instinct, released by Rare in 1995. And nowadays, this game kind of has a cult following to it. The games are okay, but one thing this game definitely had and that it was notorious for was insanely difficult combinations. Just the button presses you had to do to do anything you know worthwhile in this game, it was just insanely difficult to master. I would much rather play Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat. Up next is Kirby's Avalanche, released by HAL Laboratory in 1995, and this is like a Tetris, like Puyo Puyo kind of game, and you're going through, and I don't know what these are supposed to be, if they're like little jelly beans or something like that, it's kind of what they look like to me, but you have to get four of them connected, and that will eliminate them. As you can see, you can make any kind of shape you want, as long as they all directly connect, and you just go against a computer or another player. Up next is Kirby's Dream Land 3, released by HAL Laboratory in 1997, and this is just a continuation of the Kirby franchise. In this game, you can take the powers and abilities of a lot more enemies, so that's pretty fun. But overall, I mean, if you've played one Kirby game, you've kind of played them all. They add new graphics and a few new mechanics here and there, but overall, I mean, if you like Kirby, you should like this game. Up next is Kyle Petty's No Fear Racing, released by Leland Interactive Media in 1995. And as you can see, the game graphically is just complete garbage. I mean, overall, the frame rate is super low, so the game looks choppy all the time. There's really nothing crazy that you have to do. I mean, you know, the kind of angled effects that the cars give is kind of neat, but overall, I don't really see how you could lose this game. You just go and turn a little bit. Up next is The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, released by Nintendo in 1992. And reviews for this game are a dime a dozen because it is such a fantastic game. This is the epitome of what an action-adventure RPG should be. And this was the mold for many games for many years. And the game overall, I mean, it's great. It's just, If you haven't played it, you have to. Here we have Lemmings, released by Cygnosis in 1992, and if you have ever played a Lemmings game, yep, that, that's what it is. I mean, this reminds me of just the old Lemmings on the PC or MS-DOS. I mean, it's exactly that. 
you're going around. I believe this is even the same starting level. You go, you add your ability to each lemming, they do their thing, and you get them to the exit. That's pretty much it. I mean, Super Nintendo added some better graphics, I guess. Up next, we have Lester the Unlikely, released by Visual Concepts in 1994, and the overall gameplay of this game is okay. What is really stunning about this game, though, is the graphics and the animation. I mean, just look how detailed the character is. Look how detailed the animations are. I mean, the game is beautiful. I just wish that the storyline and gameplay were, you know, a little better. Up next, we have The Lion King, released by Westwood Studios in 1994, and... The Lion King is fun. It's a very gorgeous looking game on the Super Nintendo, but I don't know whose idea the stampede level was, but they should have been fired immediately. That level is total crap and makes this game insanely hard. There is no way a kid back then could have beat that level. I mean, I remember playing it as a kid and I ended up rage quitting this game every time. Up next is The Lord of the Rings Volume 1, released by Interplay Entertainment in 1994, and this one is a top-down RPG. It feels like it's trying to be kind of Final Fantasy-esque, but with, I don't know, more detailed graphics. It's kind of boring, though. There's a lot of reading that you got to do and not much action going on, but essentially, I mean, that is The Lord of the Rings, right? Lots of reading, not much action. Last up for this video is The Magical Quest, starring Mickey Mouse, released by Capcom in 1992. And this is another one of those games. It is absolutely gorgeous on this console. It is your typical platformer, and you go through on your magical adventure. But, I mean, the game is just, it's so much fun. It reminds me of old, like, Rescue Rangers style games. It's just super fun. Up first for this video is Mario Paint, released by Nintendo in 1992. And other than being a program or game that uses the pretty cool Super Nintendo mouse to do artwork and stuff, it's actually a really cool music making program as well. And if you go online and just search for Mario Paint music, you're going to find a lot of amazing things that people have been able to create using this. Up next is Mario's Early Years, Fun with Letters, released by the Software Toolworks in 1994. And this is one of those kind of third-party kind of offshoot games where Nintendo let another company use one of their IPs to create something new. It is a learning and educational game. And honestly, I don't think that it's that great, but it's also not geared towards me as a demographic. But it does seem pretty simplistic, even for its target demo. Now here we have Mario's Time Machine, released by the Software Toolworks in 1993, and although this game looks better than the previous one in this video, its gameplay in my mind is actually worse. It had a really cool concept about taking you throughout like time and the world and everything, but I just don't think that it was executed very well, and the game actually happens to be pretty darn boring. Up next, we have MechWarrior 3050, released by Tiburon Entertainment in 1995, and unfortunately, I was having a lot of trouble getting consistent footage from this game. It kept kind of glitching out on me. I'm not sure if I just need to reflow the solder on it to get it to work a little better, but even after a lot of cleaning, I still couldn't get the game to play very well. But overall, it is a pretty fun game. It's nothing crazy, but it, I mean, it's okay. Up next is Mega Man X, released by Capcom in 1994, and although the label on this cartridge is absolutely ugly, I have since done a label upgrade and gotten a new copy of the game, the game itself is fantastic. It is gorgeous compared to original Mega Man games. And, I mean, don't get me wrong, those games were still awesome, but this just took it to a whole new level, and it added so many new mechanics that just kept this franchise alive for many years to come. Up next is Mega Man X2, released by Capcom in 1995, and in my opinion, this one is better than Mega Man X in a lot of ways, mechanics-wise, bugs-wise, and graphics, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. They did polish things up and redo some colors and stuff like that here and there, but overall, I think the levels in this one are far superior, and I just had a lot more fun playing this game. Up next is Metal Combat Falcon's Revenge, released by Intelligent Systems in 1993, and this one is actually a Super Scope game. So the Super Scope was the zapper, but for the Super Nintendo, so it is a light gun game, and it's actually a lot of fun. I did find this to be a lot more fun than, say, Super Scope 6, the game that came with that actual accessory. And here we have Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, released by Natsume in 1994, and this one is just classic beat-em-up action. You're going around and you're fighting all the, I think they're called putties, and as you can see right here, playing as Jason, the Red Ranger, 
and just going around and beating up the baddies. It is just a side-scrolling beat-em-up with a Power Ranger skin on it. And here we have Mortal Kombat, released by Sculptured Software in 1993. And while the game is still fun and the mechanics are essentially the same as the Genesis version, this one had no blood. So that's pretty boring for a Mortal Kombat game. But, I mean, at least you still get the fighting, I guess, right? And here we have Mortal Kombat 2, released by Sculptured Software in 1994. And this one, I think, is far superior to the first one. The first one is, of course, a lot of fun. But the second one, I don't know. The gameplay, it was more refined. You got more characters. And, as you can see, you got blood. So, made it just as good as the Genesis version. And, I mean, it was really just your preference, Nintendo or Sega. And here we have Mortal Kombat 3, released by Sculptured Software in 1995. And the biggest thing that I remember about this one was the addition of Shiva. So you always had Goro, the four-armed guy, but in this one you got Shiva, the four-armed lady. And man, she is brutal. I always loved playing as her when I played Mortal Kombat 3 or 3 Ultimate, which is next up in this video. Now here we have Mortal Kombat 3 Ultimate, released by Avalanche Software in 1996. And this game had a much more expanded roster. You got a ton more characters from canon. And it just, I don't know. The game, it had similar play to number three. They did tweak some things. But overall, I thought three was better than this one, a better game. But I do like the expanded roster in this game. Up next is NBA All-Star Challenge, released by Beam Software in 1992. And this one is... I mean, it's just like a one-on-one -on -one basketball game. As you can see right here, playing half court. I will say graphically, the fact that they have reflections on the ground, I don't know, it's just really cool to see that in this era. I mean, you didn't really see effects like that. But overall, I mean, it's just kind of a one-on-one -on -one basketball game. Nothing crazy. Up next is NBA Jam Tournament Edition, released by Iguana Entertainment in 1995. And this will always be my favorite sports game or favorite sports franchise for video games. I love NBA Jam. I always played it on Sega as a kid, but even playing it on the Super Nintendo, it's just as fun. It has all the magic of NBA Jam and the Tournament Edition added new players and teams. So that's awesome. Up next, we have NBA Live 95, released by Electronic Arts in 1994, and this one took a totally different camera approach than any of the other ones I've played. As you can see, it's kind of an isometric view, and you see the court at an angle. One thing I will say about this game, though, is I can't think of any other Super Nintendo game where I experienced slowdown or lag in the game, and this one definitely has it. When everyone's on screen, it slows down. And here we have NCAA Basketball, released by Sculptured Software in 1992. And those people knew how to make a cool game, man. As you can see right here, they went for a like moving camera kind of thing. So the camera is constantly rotating around the player depending on where they are. And it gives you these really cool 3D effects in the game. And I mean, it's a little distracting having, you know, just a blue area everywhere. But the game overall is pretty fun. Up next is NHL Stanley Cup, released by Sculptured Software in 1993. And this game, as you can see, they just took the last one, kind of reskinned it, gave it some new mechanics, and then added backgrounds. I will say I do like the added backgrounds. It makes you feel like you're not kind of just floating in space. But overall, I mean, it's just a fun 16-bit quasi 3D hockey game. And here we have On the Ball, released by Taito in 1992. And this game is pretty fun because it kind of reminds me of the Sonic bonus levels. So you're just rotating the screen around and the arrows are showing you where the ball needs to go next. And you got to make sure that the ball isn't like slamming into stuff so you don't break it or anything like that. But overall, I mean, it's kind of a weird semi 3D kind of puzzling game. And I mean, it's fun. I like it. Up next is Out of This World, released by Delphine Software International in 1992. And this is another one of those games kind of like Flashback. So it's very pixel detailed and pixel dense. As you can see, everything is animated down to the very pixel. And then you get these cool little cutscenes when things happen. And as you can see, some weird leech with a spike killed me. So, I mean, the game is kind of fun. It's just kind of weird, too. Up next, we have Pac-Man 2, The New Adventures, released by Namco in 1994, and this is definitely a new adventure. It takes Pac-Man and completely removes the Pac-Man out of it. I mean, you got the character right there, and 
he kind of moves on his own and you're just kind of using a slingshot to interact with the environment and make different things happen for him. So, I mean, it's okay. It's nothing great, but I mean, it's a little fun. Up next is Pilot Wings, released by Nintendo in 1991, and this game is phenomenal. It's another one of those ones that gives you all these cool 3D effects in the 16-bit era, but this game, I don't know, man. It's just, it was very unique, and I think it was very ahead of its time, and they did make more in the franchise because of its obvious popularity, but the game is just awesome. I really enjoy playing it. Up next is Pitfall, the Mayan Adventure, released by Redline Games in 1994. And from what I could tell in playing it, I think you're kind of playing as the original uh, Pitfall guy. I think his name was Harry. I think you're playing as his son. And obviously, it is way more advanced than Atari 2600 days, as you can see by the graphics and it actually, you know, having graphics. And it's it's pretty fun. It's kind of fast paced. Up next is Populous, released by Bullfrog Productions in 1991. And this game seems like the kind of game that you would have lost a lot of time playing when you were a kid. It took me a while to figure out what to even do in this. But I do like the premise where you're kind of moving the map around that's in that upper left corner. And then it creates this 3D space for you to view. I don't know. It's kind of like a Sim City kind of thing, I guess. Up next, we got Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday, released by Phoenix Interactive Entertainment in 1995. And this game is actually really fun. I don't know why they haven't made, or maybe I just haven't seen, other Porky Pig games. This is the only one I can think of, but it's really fun. It's very graphically easy on the eyes. The coloring is awesome. Gameplay is on point. I mean, the game is great. I really enjoyed playing it. And last up for this video is Power Moves, released by Kaneko in 1993. And this is like the poor man Street Fighter. I mean, I guess this dude right here is supposed to be like a Ryu or like a Bruce Lee kind of guy. I don't know. The game is okay. It plays better than you would expect for a kind of knockoff fighting game. But overall, I mean, eh, eh. It's all right. I'd rather play Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat, though. Tiny Morphin Power Rangers The Fighting Edition was released by Bandai in 1995 and takes that classic, you know, 1v1 kind of fighting game style with Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, all those things, but puts it into a 16-bit Power Rangers shell. And, I mean, it's a pretty fun game. You're getting to go at it as Megazords and things like that, but overall, it's just a generic fighting game. Up next, we have Prehistoric Man, released by Titus Software in 1996. And this is your typical action-adventure platformer, side-scroller kind of game. I mean, graphically, it is very easy on the eyes. It's pretty fun, and it has some basic platforming elements to it, but... Overall, I mean, that's pretty much what it is. It's just a basic platformer. And here we have Rock and Roll Racing, released by Interplay Entertainment in 1993. And it definitely has some RC Pro-Am from the NES days kind of vibes to it. And the game is awesome. You can actually catch air in this game by going over all the different jumps. It's super fast-paced. You get all your different power-ups and stuff. And it's got a pretty banging soundtrack to it as well. And here we have Romance of the Three Kingdoms 2, released by Koei in 1992. And if you've ever played a Dynasty Warriors style game, think of that, but a much, much earlier version of those kind of games. They are just way too involved for my taste for these kind of games. I like strategy as much as the next person, but man, these things go super in-depth. Up next is Sequest DSV, released by Malibu Games in 1995. And I actually like this port of it better than the one on the Genesis. I don't know, I think it looks a little better, it's a little more vibrant, not as dark. And I think it controls a little better too, but overall you're just going around on the Sequest submarine and taking out the baddies and you know, running some missions. And here we have SimCity, released by Nintendo in 1991. And while this simulator is a lot of fun, it's of course where it got its start, I actually prefer SimCity 2000 over this version, just because I find it to be more fun, a little more in-depth, and I don't know, just kind of easier to get around. Up next is Spawn the Video Game, released by Acclaim Entertainment in 1995, and this game is actually a lot of fun. It can be brutal at times, and it can be difficult, but it's a really fun platformer slash beat-em-up style game. 
you do get some pretty cool power-ups and things like that and different special moves but the specials are really hard to actually get them to work except for you know this basic like jump spin kick thing but overall really fun game and it looks great up next is Speedy Gonzalez Los Gatos Benditos released by Acclaim Entertainment in 1995 and this game is super vibrant and it reminds me of a cross between Sonic and like you know Saturday morning cartoons kind of vibes the game is super fun it is definitely fast paced I mean it's Speedy Gonzalez but Overall, I mean, I had a blast playing this. It kind of reminded me of the Porky Pig game. Super fun and unique. Up next is an absolute classic, and that is Star Fox, released by Nintendo in 1993, famous for using the FX chip. There were several games that did use it, but this one, I believe, was the first. And as you can see, it pushes the 16-bit console into the 3D polygonal space. So, very basic shapes and everything, but... This is an awesome game, and it really pushed the hardware to its limit. Up next, we have Star Trek Starfleet Academy Starship Bridge Simulator, released by Interplay Entertainment in 1994. And in this one, you go around, you can learn about the different aspects of what you're supposed to do, and then you go into the actual bridge simulator, where you get to do a bunch of different missions and stuff like that, and see what it would be like to be on the bridge of a Starfleet vessel. So it's pretty cool. And up next, we got Street Fighter 2, released by Capcom in 1992. And I don't know what it is. Maybe I'm biased because I grew up playing it on this console instead. But I just like the Super Nintendo versions of these kinds of games. Mortal Kombat, definitely on Genesis. But here on Super Nintendo, I love me some Street Fighter 2. Excellent game. Excellent combos. Just everything is awesome in this game. And I actually even have the Champion Edition Arcade. Like the legit one, not the arcade one-up version. And here we have Street Fighter II Turbo, released by Capcom in 1993. And in addition to adding additional characters to the roster, this one actually sped everything up if you did Turbo Mode. And it takes a little bit of getting used to, but overall, I do like Turbo Mode. It just makes the game that much more fast-paced and challenging. It was super awesome when this came out. Up next is Stunt Race FX, released by Nintendo in 1994. And this is another one of those FX games. As you can see, all these games typically have the same kind of thing, 3D polygonal shapes. And in this game, it's really cool what they tried to do. And the gameplay overall is pretty neat, but man, is it slow. The frame rates are just garbage in this game, even despite it being kind of wacky and fun. Up next, we have Super Adventure Island, released by Hudson Soft in 1992. And if you've ever played an Adventure Island game, this is essentially the same thing, just with a new skin, slightly modified story, things like that, continuation of the old days. But the game is still super fun. And I would highly recommend it if you have never played an Adventure Island game. Up next, we have Super Bases Loaded, released by Jaleco in 1991. And this game is a vast improvement over its NES predecessors. As you can see, the graphics are far superior, which you would expect going from 8-bit to 16-bit. But they added so many new gameplay mechanics that made it feel like you were actually playing a baseball game. This is a fantastic game, and that's coming from someone who really does not like sports games. Up next is Super Battle Tank War in the Gulf, released by Absolute Entertainment in 1992. And this game took me a long time to figure out what it was that I was supposed to do and where I was supposed to go. They have so much vast space between various enemies that I don't imagine this game was ever really that fun for people. I mean, it seems like one of those ones you plug it in, you give it about a half hour, and then you're bored. And yet, for some reason, they made a sequel, Super Battle Tank 2, released by Absolute Entertainment in 1992. Continuation of the same, the maps look a little bit better, there's more details on them, but they still look pretty like Atari 2600 jank status. And overall, I mean, other than a slight graphics tweak, the game is just... In my opinion, not very fun. I just, I did not care for this game at all. Up next is Super Black Bass, released by Hot B in 1993. And you guessed it, it's a fishing game. They did some pretty cool stuff with the graphics in it. I will give them that. And I've never been a fan of really any sports game. And I mean, fishing is a sport. But I mean, this game, it's cool. I would much rather have my fishing in like a Zelda game or something like that. 
Now here's a fun one. That is Super Bomberman, released by Hudson Soft in 1993. And this is one of the first games that I'm aware of that used the Super B multi-tap. So you could do multiplayer up to, I believe, five players with this game. And this game is fantastic. The solo missions are great. It's just excellent Bomberman gameplay. And the multiplayer is just, it's insane having that many people playing all at once on a Super Up next, we got Super Bomberman 2, released by Hudson Soft in 1994. And this took everything about the previous game, made it better, and got rid of any of the extra fluff. This game is awesome. This Super Bomberman 2 is just on another level. And again, it has amazing multiplayer in it again. I mean, the, you really can't get better multiplayer on the Super Nintendo than the Super Bomberman games. Up next is Super Caesar's Palace, released by Virgin Interactive in 1993. And this game is dumb. I'm sorry, I don't like gambling in real life, but this game is just odd. I mean, you're playing a virtual horse racing game right here. You can walk around the casino and play other things. The controls are super jank. They don't work like well at all. This is just a terrible game. Now here's a not terrible game. That is Super Double Dragon, released by Trade West in 1992. And this is a fantastic beat em up. It takes everything you love about the original Double Dragon games on the NES and brings it into all of its 16-bit glory. This game is fantastic. If you like any Double Dragon games or you like beat-em-ups in general, I think you'll love this one. Up next, we have Super Empire Strikes Back, released by LucasArts in 1993. And I really like the Star Wars games on the NES, but I gotta say, Super Nintendo took it way to another level. I mean... The lightsaber action, all the different enemies, the colors, the worlds, the music, everything is so cool in these games. And they made a bunch of them, so you never really ran out of things to do. These games are awesome. Here's another classic on the console. That is Super Metroid, released by Nintendo in 1994. And if you were a fan of the original Metroid game, awesome. Good for you. This one is better. I don't care what anyone says, this game set the bar for so many games in the future. There's a reason there's games that are called Metroidvania. You know, Castlevania, Metroid, most amazing games ever. Yeah, this one does not disappoint. And last up for this video is the Super NES Super Scope 6, released by Nintendo in 1992. And this was essentially the Super Nintendo Zapper. I mean, it was all light gun stuff, but it was a gigantic bazooka looking thing. And there are better Super Scope games than the default one that comes with it. But I mean, it's pretty cool. It's like, you know, a hardware test. It shows you everything that it can actually do. Mario World was released by Nintendo in 1991. And this one is a classic staple on the console. Anyone who had a Super Nintendo had Super Mario World. It was a pack-in on almost every variation. And the game is fantastic. It wasn't the first time it had an overworld, but it really took the overworld to a whole new level. And the gameplay in 16-bit was just mind-blowing at the time. Next up, we have Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, released by Nintendo in 1996. And this was the first time I'm aware of where Square and Nintendo partnered up, especially using an actual Nintendo IP with the Mario franchise. This game is regarded as one of the best games on this console, and it also spawned a future series, which is amazing, which is all of the Paper Mario games, Mario and Luigi, all of those. What a great game. Up next is Super Mario All-Stars and Super Mario World, released by Nintendo in 1993, and this is a combo cart featuring the two games, one of which is actually a pack of remakes of all of the previous games released on the NES, including the Lost Levels, which is the original version in Japan of Super Mario 2. Up next we have Super Punch-Out released by Nintendo in 1994 and this takes all of the classic gameplay from the NES with that Punch-Out and Mike Tyson's all of that stuff but it gives it a major graphics update as apparent by the 16-bit era but it also improved gameplay and made everything more seamless in my opinion more fun and 
Honestly, I think this is the best version of this game that's ever been released by Nintendo. And here we have Super R-Type, released by Irem in 1991. And this just continues the classic shoot-em-up franchise of R-Type. And on this console, it is fantastic. The gameplay is great. It ramps up at a nice steady level. And honestly, for games like this, I prefer playing them only in 16-bit. Sure, you get like all the bullet hell things of modern shooters, but this one, I don't know, it's more fun. It doesn't seem as chaotic. Up next is Super Return of the Jedi, released by LucasArts in 1994, and this is just more classic Star Wars gameplay on the Super Nintendo. This one actually starts out kind of unique compared to the other ones though. As you can see, you are doing this kind of like F-Zero kind of gameplay in the beginning, and it's really fun actually, very 3D-esque for the console and it plays really well. It is difficult at times, but it's a lot of fun. Up next is the original one, Super Star Wars, released by LucasArts in 1992. And this is like a side-scrolling beat-em-up slash shooter kind of game. I don't know, it gets pretty chaotic at times, but overall it is pretty fun. I don't think the graphics are as good as the later two games that came out, but it is still a fun game, and I really enjoy the gameplay of all of these LucasArts games on the Super Nintendo. Next up, we have Sydney Hunter and the Caverns of Death, released by Collector Vision Games in 2018, and unfortunately the Retron 5 doesn't really do well with homebrew style games, but this game is actually fantastic. The graphics are great, gameplay is awesome, Awesome for any kind of platformer that you would expect and I would highly recommend picking one of these up if you have a Super Nintendo. Up next we have Tecmo Super NBA Basketball released by Tecmo in 1993 and this game for a basketball game isn't that bad. You guys know I am not a fan of sports games on gaming consoles but this one it felt kind of like NBA Jam but with a lot more players on the screen if that makes any sense but I mean it was okay it was kind of fun but still i don't really prefer sports games up next is tetris 2 released by nintendo in 1994 and honestly i did not really care for this game it felt like it was trying to be like dr mario mixed with tetris as you can see you have the different colored shapes and you have to rotate and match them up to the different colors that are on the screen but honestly i mean if i wanted to play dr mario i would just play dr mario i don't need to play an actual tetris version of it here we have The Tick, released by Fox Interactive in 1994, and this game is just a beat-em-up in a tick skin. Now, it is kind of fun and goofy seeing the different mannerisms that the tick has. As you can see right there, he kind of just flicks the bad guy to get him away. But overall, I mean, it feels like pretty much any other beat-em-up, just in a skin of The Tick. That's really it. Now, here we have Top Gear, released by Kemco in 1992. And this game is just like straight up arcade racing. I mean, it's fun, graphically it's pleasing, but the game is almost too easy, really. I mean, once I got a hang of the controls, it's pretty much just like any racing game you would expect, and it doesn't really have any real difficulty to it. Now here we have Top Gear 3000, released by Kemco in 1995, and this one they added a whole like backstory, like it's a galactic space race you know, huge competition going on every millennia. And I mean, the cars look a little more futuristic, but honestly, the gameplay of this one was way more fun. They added more depth to the levels and the tracks were more dynamic. I don't know. This was a really cool game. I like this one. Up next is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time, released by Konami in 1992. And this is like arcade turtles at its finest. Super fun gameplay. You get all the characters that you would expect. You're going through taking out all of Shredder's minions. And the game is fantastic. On the Super Nintendo, it's much more interactive than the NES versions, which is great. As you saw, you know, you could throw guys into the screen and break the fourth wall. Up next is Una Racers, released by Nintendo in 1994, and admittedly, before doing this video, I had never actually played this game, and it's pretty fun. Once I figured out how to actually control it and make my guy go faster, because I was losing miserably when I first played this game. But overall, it's a really fun concept. I've never seen a unicycle game before, and I mean, for a one-off, it was, it was really fun. Up next, we have Vegas Stakes, released by Nintendo in 1993, and this tries to like add a story to a casino game where you're traveling with friends and all this stuff, and they're joining you at the tables, and I don't know. I don't understand gambling or the obsession with it myself, but playing a video game for it seems even more boring. There's nothing real at stake, so what's the point? 
And here we have Wolfenstein 3D, released by Imagineer in 1994. And this is classic Wolfenstein on the Super Nintendo. However, everything that kind of made it Wolfenstein was removed per Nintendo's rules. So you can see a picture of Hitler, but you'll have no idea it's Hitler because there's no swastikas anywhere or anything like that. And overall, I mean, it's okay on the Super Nintendo. Up next, we got Marvel Super Heroes in War of the Gems, released by Capcom in 1996. And the whole premise of this is you are fighting on Earth to get all of the Infinity Stones for the Gauntlet. So this is just the practice room that I'm playing in right here, and I'm Captain America against Evil Daredevil. But overall, I mean, it's just a generic fighting game. There isn't really anything standout that I could see about it. Up next is Yoshi's Cookie, released by Bulletproof Software in 1993. And this game is fun. It's kind of like a Tetris game and kind of like a Dr. Mario game, sort of. But you have stuff coming in from the top and from the side. And you have to get everything to match up by moving around the shapes and the cookies and the hearts and stuff to get it all to line up so that you can clear the screen. Fun concept. Up next is Super Mario World 2, which is Yoshi's Island, released by Nintendo in 1995, and this game is fantastic. It has spawned so many sequels and really kind of set the bar for what the aesthetic of a Yoshi game would be in the future. It's excellent gameplay. You know, you have to keep Baby Mario safe. You go on a collect-a-thon with stars and flowers and stuff, and you're just going on Yoshi's adventure. It's awesome. Up next, we have Yoshi's Safari, released by Nintendo in 1993, and this is a Super Scope game. So you're kind of just riding on the back of Yoshi, and it's like auto-driving you through the course, and your goal is to shoot stuff at all the enemies so that they stop hitting Yoshi, and that's about it. I mean, from the gameplay, it kind of looks like F-Zero meets Yoshi. I don't know. It's kind of weird, but kind of fun. And the last game in this collection series is Zoop, released by Viacom New Media in 1995. And I guess it's kind of like a puzzle strategy game. I don't know. I didn't really understand. I would shoot stuff of one color, and it would change my color, and then I would go shoot the same color, and sometimes it would go away. Sometimes it wouldn't. I don't know. The game kind of confused me, but, I mean, it was kind of pretty. I guess. And there you have it, everyone. That is everything that was in the five-part collection series for the Super Nintendo, showing everything that I had in my collection at the time. Now, my Super Nintendo library has definitely grown since then, and maybe someday I'll do an update video on it. But for now, that's what you guys get. Now, if you liked today's video, please be sure to let me know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, please be sure to also hit those like and subscribe buttons, as well as that little notification bell, so that you can alert every time I got a new video coming out. Now, as always, I'm Game Dad. I thank you guys for watching, and I'll catch you later.